Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us um, for shining a, shining a Light at the Kellyanne Dolan Memorial Fund. This is when we really take the opportunity to talk about an important topic that could be a valued um, resource for our families out there that are caring for um, a chronically ill or special needs child. And our topic today is really taking a look at um, tax tips and financial planning um, or financial resources, I should say, for our families. And I wanted to welcome our two guests today. We have Jason Paterka. Hi, Jason. Good morning. Um, Jason is with the accounting firm Baum Smith & Clements up in North Wales. So welcome. And Scott Griffith is also joining us. Scott is an attorney and a partner with Rawl and Henderson, a Center City law firm. So thank you both for joining us today. So I wanted to get into this topic a little bit. I came across a um, statistic from the Department of Health and Human Services that um, there are roughly 9.4 million children um, in this country that fall into the category of having a special um, health care need. And that really represents about 20% of children under age 18 um, in our country. So this is a, a significant issue, certainly compounded by um, the current state of our world, confronted with an unprecedented um, pandemic in modern time. So welcoming you both to share what can we offer in terms of information, um, some tips that will be helpful for parents to kind of offset that financial burden. So Jason, I wanted to start um, with you and talk about it from a tax perspective because sometimes there are things that are related to a medical or special needs condition that we don't think of um, in being able to deduct? The IRS doesn't make it easy to deduct medical expenses to begin with. They, they really haven't in recent history. Um, and it's only gotten worse with the Tax Cuts and Job Act that passed in 2017. In order to take an itemized deduction for medical expenses, you have to be able to itemize in the first place. And for that, you have to have itemized deductions that exceed what is called the standard deduction that basically everyone gets. Mm -hmm. In that case, um, with the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, that standard deduction was doubled. So it makes it even harder to reach that level. Yeah. In addition to that, there's a further restriction for 2020 your medical expenses have to exceed seven and a half percent of your adjusted gross income, which is mm. essentially your total income with, with some adjustments, but that's really neither here nor there. So basically you lose that first seven and a half percent. You don't get any benefit from that. Once you get over that amount, that's when the expenses really that's when you really can start to save. If you reach the level where you're itemizing and you have medical expenses that you can take, it's I've seen it with uh, with people who have children with special needs, and I've also seen it very often with elderly people, where okay. you reach a certain age, the medical expenses increase, and then they can take advantage of it. It doesn't normally affect most in most taxpayers. The in addition to that, now, with the change in administration, I don't know exactly if this is going to happen or not. Tax law is kind of up in the air right now. Mm -hmm. It is scheduled, the limitation on medical expenses is scheduled to increase to 10% after 2020. So you have to have exceed 10% of your AGI in order to deduct it, whether that goes through or not. I, Honestly, I, you would need a crystal ball to be able to tell yeah. at this point. Um, so this I, sounds a little depressing. Is there there any good news in terms of, you know, some some hopeful tips that we can offer? You know, 
There is. Um, once, basically, once you hit the hit the level that you can itemize, the expenses add up very quickly. Okay. Everyone knows about the obvious expenses that you can take, like uh, if you pay out of pocket medical insurance, you can take that as a as a uh, itemized deduction. Any copays you pay, you can take. Um, Cost of any medical equipment you can pay. Okay. Uh, pay for. Um, a common example would be like um, diabetic test strips are deductible. Okay. Um, one thing you want to be certain of is to track your mileage because okay. even though mileage is only deductible at, I believe it's 17 cents currently, it adds up quickly. And that's. 17 cents per mile that that can be a big savings that people don't often think of um, in addition for people who have children that are under the age of 13 there is a child care credit that's available it's outside of the itemized deductions area so you can take it even if you don't itemize normally that phases out when the child reaches the age of 13. But if you have a dependent that has medical difficulties, that there is no upper age limit. You can take that dependent care credit up for as long as necessary. That's great. The mileage is really an important one. We, we are often getting requests um, from families and it really is related to the costs associated with travel for treatment um, because you're going to go, you know, you're going to spare no expense to travel to the, the best facility um, and care that your child can receive. Um, mm -hmm. And that adds up quickly. In addition, um, I mentioned the 17 cents per mile standard rate, but that's not including, you can also take airfare. Um, train fare. One thing that does save people money is parking and tolls is in addition to that 17 cents a mile. So you can take any, you know, easy pass tolls you pay, any parking you pay, that's also included. That's great. Great to hear. Scott, I want to kind of um, bring you in and I know um, we can also talk we can both talk about the, the ABLE accounts. Um, you know, I introduced um, Scott as an attorney, but he also um, is the father um, of a beautiful little girl who's a tween now, special mm -hmm. needs. Um, and you've gone down this path. So this firsthand experience, you know, how to navigate it, I would love to hear just from a parental perspective, um, I'm sure it's been exasperating, but what's been helpful um, for you and Danielle in being able to advocate for um, Chloe and plan for the, you know, daunting expenses that are associated. Well, so in one perspective, um, uh, you know, the, look, the most important piece of this is the insurance aspect of it. Um, and so the question of uh, medical expenses comes through uh, as it relates to both private insurance and then, of course, any uh, state-sponsored insurance that there is in terms of Medicaid. And um, if you have a child who, uh, like Chloe, uh, has a, a severe uh, uh, disability uh, from both an intellectual standpoint uh, an emotional standpoint and sort of just from a developmental delay standpoint. Um, the, the first thing that I would suggest is that you work to straighten out the insurance aspects of care. Um, you know, at the beginning of, of Chloe's life, we spent significant amounts of time working through with the private insurer that I have for my family and myself along with um, the, uh, the social work people at, uh, at the hospital where she was born uh, in order to um, work through with them how we should be 
um, telling folks at either the Social Security Administration or at um, uh, the Department of Public Welfare, at least in Pennsylvania, how uh, her condition is going to impact her life um, such that we were able to then have her um, through the medical professionals and through the social workers have her uh, declared uh, to be <clears throat> fully disabled. Now, um, there that was probably for us never a, uh, a sort of a doubt that that was what was going to happen. And I, I appreciate that for some, um, that is something that uh, is a difficult diagnosis to be made. Um, but at that point, we wound up with uh, full benefits. Um, and uh, so in terms of the expenses, um, those expenses are handled for her, both her care uh, and for her medical expenses through either private insurance or through, um, or through the uh, Medicaid insurance through the state of, or through the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Um, but I do think that the, the, the key tip there, I suppose, is that you've got to sit down with the medical providers, no matter whether the child is just born and is effectively disabled or whether or not this is a situation where you have a child that is uh, sort of, for lack of a better term, growing into whatever disability it is, um, such that um, the medical professionals are able to help you uh, with the insurance companies. Um, social workers, as I said, are invaluable uh, people. And then the last people are really the educators. If you have a child that is already at school age, um, and they pick up on something. Um, that is something that really you need to um, push forward. Yeah, I like what you said about though, you have to be patient, <laughs> you have to be thorough, you have to be relentless. We know yeah. that, that. I mean, as you mentioned, you know, I, I, I'm an attorney, I've been an attorney for close to 30 years. Um, I, I've advocated for many different causes and many different people's causes. And, and I think that the most surprising thing that came in my life was 13 years ago when my daughter was born and I had to advocate for her. Um, and so I think that, that the key here is that you do have to be patient, but by the same token, it's gotta all be completed. It's gotta all be thorough um, because, and the more thorough you can get the information from the doctors and the social workers and the educators, um, the more you can get them on your side to help your child, the easier it is to navigate the system because you can then learn what needs to be done. And the last piece is really to be relentless. I mean, if it if it's a matter of calling someone every you know day until they call you back, emailing them, whatever it happens to be, that's what you need to do. Um, and that is an exhausting process. Um, okay. And it is not the system is not made for the child. Um, and that's the unfortunate reality, but um, you've got to be able to just keep pushing. So. Well, and you imagine when every day presents a different host of challenges, whether it's um, a chronic medical condition or a special need, um, when you're presented and you don't have the resources at your fingertips and you're presented with an, an 80 page application from the state, and don't have someone to sit with you or a multidisciplinary team to help you learn how to respond or the proper verbiage. Um, I know countless families that have been rejected and have had to go back and reapply. So that exhaustion um, is, is not an understatement. That's right. Um, I do think with what you know, Jason um, has provided, you know, even though it's time consuming in terms of those tips, it does offset some of the cost. The um, waiver program also helps families. Um, we don't have a lot of time, but I do want to throw out, and I'm sure, Scott, it's something you're, you're well aware of too, which is the ABLE account, mm -hmm. um, that you're probably both very, very versed. But why would we suggest that as a tool, Jason? The main reason, an ABLE account is kind of like a 529 plan for someone with disabilities. It allows you to accumulate funds in a special account. The funds grow over time. And when 
those funds are distributed and used for medical expenses. You're not taxed on that increase. Additionally, it varies by states, but with Pennsylvania, if you make a pen, if you make a contribution to a PA able account, you get a deduction on your state return mm -hmm. right off of your total income for the amount of your contribution. Another benefit is that friends and family can contribute to it and that's not considered okay. income on. Is there a cap? What can go into that account each there year? Is a cap. It's the for 2020, it's $15,000, okay. which is the the gift tax exclusion. So that's it's I it seems to be tied to that. OK, that's great. So that that's another resource. Um, you know, I think I always ask, you know, in terms of closing the show, um, if there's a family out there that's listening, you know, what would you want to say to them? Um, so Scott, you kind of shared it. I think your, your, your phrase that we already put up on the screen, but if there is a family out there, um, what would you offer just as some words of wisdom or encouragement? I, I, I think the most I would offer is, is, is to just, um, recognize, as I said earlier, the system is not unfortunately built for the children. And, um, once I think you wrap your head around that concept, it becomes a lot more easier to um, recognize that it's not personal. It's not against you personally that they're not giving you these benefits. Yeah. Um, and, and then you can truly become an advocate for your child. Um, because if you take the personal part of it away um, and recognize that um, there are hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands of children in not only the Commonwealth and then across the country that are dealing with the same thing. Um, you, you can see that from a sort of purely business standpoint, the way you get yourself first is by uh, recognizing that it's not about you. It's about, it's about the child and it's about the fact that um, uh, the child needs this, this, um, this care. That's great. Take away the emotion and the subjectivity and look at it through an objective lens. Uh, Jason, I wanna just offer the same for you kind of as a, a tax professional, you, you've shared some great tips, but anything that you'd like to add? I would say if you're, if you're using a, a professional to help you with your taxes, to the more information you can give them, the better. A lot of times clients will just send in their information and that's really all you have. If you have concerns, pick up the phone, send an email. Um, we're more than willing to help. Sometimes we just don't know there's an issue in the first place. Right, right. And I can vouch, I just like would like to close. I know we've, we've this is such an important topic that's relevant um, to so many um, families in this situation. But both Bomb Smith and Clemens and Rawl and Henderson as companies are you know very invested um, in community um, locally and giving back um, and have done so much and we appreciate you know your support at the fund and just in our local communities so i wanted to thank you both today this was a great discussion um, that i think will be you know valuable um, to so many so thank you for participating and have a good day thank, thank you for having me